Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Bridging the Generational Gap in Transportation. Um, still seeing a few folks sign in here, but we're right at 10 o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'm Andrea Terrell, Marketing Director at H&I, and I'm sitting here with Chris Pinky, um, one of our Vice Presidents here at H&I as well. Um, today, the webinar is sponsored by H&I and also the ELITE group within the Wisconsin Motor Carriers Association. The ELITE group uh, stands for Emerging Leaders in Transportation. It's a new group we're trying to get off the ground, and emerging leaders can be young or old, but the, the, the goal of the group is really to to identify and develop that next generation of leadership within the trucking industry in Wisconsin. And really to raise awareness today that that group is out there. Um, we're trying to limit the numbers in order to be more effective. But if you are interested in this group, I would encourage you to go to witrucking.org. And there's a logo on the Wisconsin Motor Carriers website for the elite group. And there's an application to fill out. And we'd love to, to grow our group with anybody that's interested. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things before we jump into the presentation. Um, you can ask questions throughout the presentation by typing them into your chat window in GoToMeeting. Um, we'll, we'll be doing Q&A at the end, but feel free to ask questions throughout, and we'll make sure that we get those answered. Um, so jumping right into the topic, why this matters. Chris, how are, how are truck drivers born? Uh, new truck drivers born every day, Andrea. We have this in, the, in our back parking lot and uh, producing drivers just like an assembly line. Um, I wish that was the case. That would be a nice thing for the industry. But, you know, today is in more than ever, the drivers are at a premium. And we've got four different generations of drivers in the workforce. And we are losing drivers that are retiring and we are Unfortunately, I believe losing more drivers retiring that are ent entering the industry as uh, newbie fresh drivers, which is thereby creating that driver shortage. So it would be great if, if a truck driver could be born every day like this, uh, but I think we have to work a little bit harder at it. Um, so a quick introduction to H&I. Um, you, you might be wondering you know, who, who's H&I and why are you guys talking about this to us today? Um, H&I is a non-traditional insurance benefits and business advisory firm that specializes in transportation. Um, our mantra, change the game, is what makes us different. Um, we specialize in helping organizations, uh, trucking companies, take on wicked problems that stand in the way of their growth and profitability. Um, and driver recruiting is probably the, the wickedest of wicked problems right now for the industry. Um, so as we're looking at, at sources of risk, we're taking more of a broader view. So it's not just safety and physical hazards that are risks to our clients' businesses. It's um, their people, developing their culture, um, creating a brand that really differentiates them and helps them stand out to their, their customers and potential drivers, um, and some of those, those broader risks. Right. We're, we're looking at really four different categories of risk. I mean, there's people risk, there's brand, financial, and leadership. And what you're seeing right now is a white paper we've got available for download off our website. That's hni.com, H, and is in Nancy, i.com, not H and i.com, um, really addressing the people side of risk. Because the, and really the webinar today is about the people side of risk, because we need to begin addressing this people risk issue before it starts affecting our ability to conduct business and make a reasonable profit. And that's really what we're all in business for today. Um, so as Chris was saying, you know, we have four generations together in the workplace for the first time in history. Uh, my generation, Gen Y, makes up about the quarter, a quarter of the workplace today. Um, and we're expecting a fifth generation some people call them Gen Z, some people call them 9-11 generation, but they're about to, to make their own splash in the workplace as well. Um, so things are changing, changing pretty quickly. And, you know, with, with the four different generations, if you think about it, it really complicates things. Because what if you have a baby boomer that is a driver being managed by a Generation Y type 
uh, person, they're looking at their their view of life is through two completely different lenses. And really what it comes down to is it's all about understanding. Um, I think if people understand each other, they can work together and manage each other and, and, and coexist where if a boomer doesn't understand what a Gen Y person is made up of and, and why they think why they think, there can be a lot of conflict. And conflict is going to slow down our organizations and uh, really conflict can bring everything to a grinding halt. Um, so looking at some of the things that have, have changed between the generations, uh, we've gone from Sean Cassidy's of the world being the heart throb to Chris, what would you say is the modern Sean Cassidy? Well, I'd have to say Justin Bieber. And yep. w one thing notice that hasn't changed is the hairdo. Yeah, that's apparently, that's the look for the Biebs of the world. We've gone from the yearbook to Facebook. Um, when I graduated from high school, we actually didn't have a, a print yearbook my final year of school. And you know what's kind of funny about that, Andrea, is Facebook um, used to be the young persons, the Gen X, Gen Y. Um, Facebook is now used by probably more boomers to share pictures and of their grandkids and, and things like that than my 18-year-old son and my 15-year-old my son. Yeah, and it's amazing to see how drivers have leaned into Facebook and YouTube as ways to kind of connect with each other and connect with the folks back at home. Um, we've gone from story time, sitting on little carpet squares. Chris, did you get carpet squares? Did carpet you... squares, milk, and nap time. <laughs> yep, and so now we're, I mean, we're seeing first, second, third graders have mobile devices. Um, somebody sent me an ad the other day for a little toddler potty chair with an iPad stand, if you could believe that. Um, my wife was a, a kindergarten teacher, and in her school they were introducing technology as early as kindergarten with iPads, and, and kids today just intuitively get the technology and mobile devices. And, you know, one of the maybe the unintended consequences of technology would be for the generation that really uses and depends on the, the technology, it gives them the feeling of never really being alone. They're always a text away from communicating with somebody. They're never alone with themselves. Yeah, yeah. there's some, some real positive things about that, some negative things too probably. Right. But one thing that you can't really get away from is it's definitely different. Absolutely. We've gone from Mark Spitz. No one thinking that those records would be broken, to Michael Phelps. Yep, record smashed. Um, a lot of other things came along with that, but we can save that conversation for a later date. Um, we're also seeing newer generations kind of move from the concept of work-life balance to really um, work-life integration. Um, they, I mean, they bring their personal lives to work. They want to have fun at work. Um, but on the flip side, they don't necessarily mind being connected after hours as well. So think about it like this. You know, the boomers typically, they're at work from 7 to 5, putting in 10, 10 hours. And the Gen X, Gen Y, they might not be at work at 7 in the morning. They may come in at 10, but they may stay until 8. But they're also more comfortable doing things and being connected, like Andrea said, outside of the office checking emails on Saturdays, Sundays, um, you know, really it's work-life integration for them. It's not really work-life balance. Um, so here's kind of an interesting statistic. By age 30, um, these five major life milestones, so graduating from school, leaving the house, becoming financially stable and able to support yourself, getting married, having kids, um, in 1960, Seven out of ten people had met these life milestones by age 30. Um, so we're going to do a quick little poll here. This, this technology will cooperate with me. Um, all right, let's see. I guess we're trying to... Okay, hopefully you can see the poll on your screen here. Um, so by, by 1960, 7 in 10 had met all five of these life milestones. Um, if you had to guess what that number looked like in 2012, 
please put in your guess. So it only let me put in five choices, so I reduced it to the odd numbers. Um, we're seeing about 69% voted so far, so we'll give people just a few more minutes, a few more seconds. Okay, so 65% um, of you said 3 out of 10, 23% said 5 out of 10, 5% um, 5 5 said 9 out of 10, and then 7% guessed 1 out of 10. Um, the correct answer, believe it or not, is 1 out of 10. So there can be a lot of different things that are impacting that. Um, I mean, some people are uh, deciding to put off school, putting off marriage, putting off having kids. Um, it's, we can debate about whether it's right or wrong, but it's definitely definitely something different. You know, I think what this really illustrates, Andrea, is that different things were important back in 1960, and the, the measures of success um, for maybe the boomers and, and people like that, it's just different today. And we all tend to view our life uh, through our own lens as to what was important. And obviously back in 1960, it was very important for people to achieve these milestones. And today, it's maybe something a little different, whatever that might be. Um, so kind of the next logical question here is, so what? Um, it's, it's fun to talk about these generational differences and some of the things that have changed. Um, but what is it doing to our businesses? And what do we need to do differently because of it? Um, a few of the reasons why why we think it matters, um, as Chris said earlier, it's, I mean it's slowing us down. Differences between generations can cause misunderstandings that can be a huge drain on productivity uh, and prevent your team from reaching its full potential. So think about it like this: so with with a driver that's a boomer managed by a Generation Y, um, if that if, if we just can't connect and we don't understand each other, and that driver ends up leaving that slows your company way down. And if it's hard enough to get the drivers in the door today, but once we get them in the door, the good ones we want to keep. We need to do everything we can to keep those drivers. And one of the probably cheapest, most cost-effective ways is to figure out what's um, important and what is um, driving the, the different generations within the industry. Um, it also matters because, I mean, as a, as a whole, we're getting older. Um, the aging workforce means rising healthcare costs, need to fund retirement, um, higher risk of accident and injury, um, and things that can impact your kind of the cost and dynamics of your business in a, a whole host of different ways. Um, and like this little girl, we're not necessarily ready. Um, a lot of the organizations that we work with are they're struggling not only to find drivers, but to find the next generation of managers and talented leadership. Um, many of our organizations haven't adapted for these folks or um, attracted as many of them as we need to fill, fill the ones that are going to be leaving soon. You know, and I think if you looked at your driver rosters, um, the average age is probably higher than you would like it to be. My guess is somewhere in maybe the mid to low 50s. Um, we need to figure out how to attract uh, that next, next generation to the driving profession. And one way of doing that is to figure out what their drivers are and what really matters to them. Because if we don't do this, if we don't do something to affect the driver shortage today, um, it's not going to get any better. In fact, it's going to get a lot worse. And kind of related to that um, lack of succession planning that Chris touched on, um, it matters because we're facing a brain drain on an industry-wide scale. Um, a lot of experience and knowledge is getting ready to exit the industry within the next couple of years and do we have a plan for capturing that information and passing it on to the next the next round and with that you know some of the some of the knowledge I mean obviously we're going to be losing a lot of the knowledge within the industry as boomers retire but there's also opportunity the opportunity is is that things that have always been done the same way maybe a fresh set of eyes really could be good Maybe there's people that are going to look at what has always been done in one way and say, why don't we do it this different way? And it turns out to be much more efficient. So 
as, as big of a danger as that is, it's also an opportunity to get fresh ideas and fresh um, looks at things to make them better. Um, so taking a closer look at where we are today, um, we're just going to walk through really quickly a few of the, the things that make each of the generations unique. Um, this is probably something that you've heard before, so we'll, we'll go through it relatively quickly. So the matures, which were born between 1900 and 1946, you know, this is really the greatest generation. A lot of these people lived through two world wars and a, and a significant depression, and that really shaped who they are. And as a result, they're practical and they're respectful. Um, they're very dedicated, and many of these people, they go to work at, at one place when they're 20, and they retire from that same place when they're 65. Yeah, one thing to, to watch out for a little bit maybe with this generation is they're not necessarily the most politically correct individuals in our organization, um, so that can occasionally cause a little bit of tension. So the boomers, born between 46 and 1964, and really I'm going to generalize uh, the, the time period here, but say the 50s. The 50s were probably a time of bliss within the United States. I mean, things were good. You have you know, the, the, the beaver cleaver type um, situation where you know, the war is done, people are fairly optimistic, the economy is okay. So as a result, people growing up in this generation with boomers, you know, they tend to be optimistic um, and driven. They, it's their, they see it as, as they need to do better than their parents did, and that's one of the things that, that really they judge themselves by. Um, the next generation, Gen X, um, and also one thing just to note, so these date ranges, you can find a ton of different definitions for each of these generations and what exact years kind of fall into each one. Um, and I think the folks on the kind of the borderline of these tend to have a little bit of characteristics of both. But um, just for the purposes of the presentation today, I just wanted to present some high level, high level concepts related to that. So think about Gen X and what, what it was like when they were growing up. You know, high interest rates. Um, you know, I think that you know the economy was was steady, but certainly not strong. So as a result, they saw some struggle, uh, maybe with their parents and their families, and they tend to be some skeptical and unimpressed people. And uh, I'm very self-reliant, though, extremely self-reliant. Um, looking at Gen Y, um, that's my generation, um, generally optimistic, hopeful outlook on things. Um, we grew up on the group project, so that concept of pulling together and achieving things as a group is very familiar. Um, that w what to watch out for promiscuity, right there we're referring to professional promiscuity, so maybe um, job hopping a little bit, um, not sticking with an organization as long as the generations that came before them. So think about the, the environment when these people grew up. It was the dot-com boom. I mean, it was, times were good. Stock market was soaring. Um, you know, and that, that really, things were, were really good here. And that really tends to shape their outlook of being hopeful because that's what they saw. Um, the next generation, the kind of the cutoff that people are looking at right now is about 1997 in terms of birth dates. Um, so pretty soon here we're going to be seeing them start to trickle into the workforce. Uh, we, don't, we don't really know yet how that's going to play out, what their working behaviors will look like. I mean, you can look at your kids and grandkids and kind of start to get a feel for some of that, um, but it'll be inter interesting to see um, what mark they leave. I can speak from um, having a, a few children that are in this generation. You know, I think they tend to have some short attention spans, and you need to communicate them within the 180 character bits that you get in Twitter for them to be able to get it. More than that, they kind of lose interest. Yeah, and so um, I mean, one one idea that we've kind of seen floating out there about um, this generation and how they're going to to change trucking. Um, I mean, like Chris said, they're I mean they're attached to their, to their mobile devices. They think in short little bits. Um, so what can we do to make you know sitting in a truck for long periods of time where they can't have access to their technology attractive? Um, so some companies have kind of started to float 
ideas around kind of gamifying the experience of driving. So, I mean, almost like a video game, kind of projecting things on the dashboard and um, just kind of ways to cater to that generation. Well, think about how to and how to cater to that generation in recruiting. I mean, if, if you have, on your website have a four-page online application and a, a Generation Z would click on that, and this is obviously in the future, they just don't have the attention span to sit there and fill out four pages of information. They want to be in and out fast to be things moving forward. And so things are going to have to change as obviously time moves on. Um, so you've, you've probably heard all some of these things before. Um, it's kind of fun to talk about the differences between work styles and different groups of people. Um, but working with the transportation industry, we see kind of a, a whole other interesting dynamic related to um, the way driving has changed and the way that driver norms have changed over time. Um, so you know we've gone from maps to GPSs. Um, I'm embarrassed to admit that if you put me down in some random neighborhood in Milwaukee, I would not be able to find my way home without Siri or a Garmin. The um, boomers, I mean, stick shift. I mean, I think that a, a lot of us grew up learning how to drive the manual transmission cars. And um, while I'm not a huge car guy, I don't know how many manual transmissions are even left in the car population. I certainly know that kids um, growing up today don't learn typically on manual transmissions and in fact in trucking many of the manual transmissions are going the way of the automatic. You know you, you put it in drive and sit back and let, let the technology do the work. Um, on the equipment side we've seen um, the cab overs you know, going back to um, extremely practical to the generation Y with the you know the 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 truck of today, the technology, the comfort, um, certainly makes it uh, much more enjoyable to be spending 11 hours driving. You know, we've gone from seeing things like this as your R and R on the road to some really pretty nice equipment and um, newer layouts that are available to drivers. So, as far as regulations. <clears throat> The matures, I mean, there's really a low regulation from a driver type environment. I mean, yes, there were hours of service and paper logs and stuff like that. Uh, but as far as like environmental regulations, uh, workplace regulations, you know, it was really kind of just get the job done. Today, um, whether, whether you want to say fortunately or unfortunately, Trucking does exist in a real high regulation environment, which does make it challenging to be both a driver and to operate that, that trucking company, either as a dispatcher or as an executive. So I'm not sure if the audio is coming through too good on that. Let me just try one thing real quick. Um, some of you may remember this clip as kind of a um, one of the ways that trucking uh, hit the attention of pop culture. What we're dealing with here is a complete lack of respect for the law. So if you know that movie, Smokey and the Bandit, you think about Jerry Reed being the truck driver and racing like a cowboy across the, the south with a load of Coors beer, and it was kind of a romantic image. I mean, a cowboy out the road kind of defying the law and and uh, it, it certainly is not something that is probably, it's certainly for a good thing, not prevalent today and, and I'm not sure it really could even exist today. Yeah, I mean, from a risk perspective, we kind of want to dial down on the cowboy aspect and um, kind of uh, change that perspective a little bit. Um, in terms of fatalities, we've also kind of seen highway deaths decrease over over the past generation, so kind of expectations about um, how that will play out have changed. Um, so looking forward to kind of where the industry is going, um, we wanted to share a few ideas for um, kind of our vision of the future and some ideas that you can implement to help you bridge that generation gap in your organization. 
Um, so we're going to talk through just six, six ideas, um, kind of quick hit things that may be a fit for you or may be worth kind of considering down the road. So the first one is really being able to identify the right kind of talent and, and knowing what you're looking for. You know, in the, there's certain numbers that have been put out in the industry that would say that turnover costs a company anywhere between five and $10,000 uh, every time a, an employee, especially a driver, turns over. Um, we can argue the numbers, you know, five or 10, whatever they are, but any way you go, it's significant. Um, so if we can find the right people up front, maybe we can reverse a trend of turnover by being able to um, get that person on board. And the other thing that it does is identifying the right talent is, you know, we talk about engage engagement and getting everybody rowing the boat in the same direction. Think about how powerful your company could be if everybody in your company would be rowing the boat in the same direction. Because we have some people that, that, quite frankly, are rowing the other direction, and we have some people that aren't rowing at all, and we have some people that are rowing in the direction we're supposed to. And if we could engage everybody, it would certainly be powerful. Yeah, and so as we're looking at identifying the right talent, it's kind of two things. There, I mean, there's skills and the cultural fit that Chris is talking about. So and one of the tools that we've seen organizations use to do, to do this is the culture index. There's tons of tools out there like this. We're not recommending one flavor of those over the other. Um, and I mean, we're obviously struggling in terms of numbers and volume of drivers coming in. So it's, sometimes it's difficult to talk about hiring standards or think about narrowing the pool even further. Um, but as Chris was saying, if we can find the right people on the front end, we're going to be saving ourselves headaches down the road with turnover or um, accidents maybe if we're hiring some high-risk people. Well, the other thing it does is it really gives the people that are managing these drivers or employees insight as to what the core, char core characteristics are of that employee. So, um, for example, if you go to the next slide, if my, if my um, characteristics happen to be arrogant and entrepreneurial, domineering and belligerent, um, you, know, you just, it gives you insight as to what drives these particular individuals. So if, if, you, if you have somebody that's taken an, a, a culture index type test and we know up front that this person has these characteristics, number one, we may not want to hire them because somebody that's volatile, impatient, um, belligerent, I mean, that might not be the best employee, but if we did make that higher, um, this gives us insight behind the curtain as to maybe some things that um, we can do to help understand and manage that particular employee better. Yeah, and this is, a, this is an actual, this is a real driver. We um, helped one of the companies that we work with roll this out to their team and kind of benchmark some of their best drivers to see um, kind of what profiles they were looking for. Um, and I mean, when, when they met this guy, I think this, this beach right right here is kind of what, what you see in a first impression. So they're outgoing, they're talkative, they're enthusiastic. Um, but when you kind of look under the hood, some of these traits start to come out down the road that uh, can have a negative impact on your company. Um, so last year we, we held a driver recruiting summit where we had a couple of um, speakers kind of talk about things that they're doing to, to better recruit and retain drivers. And we asked the audience to kind of give us some feedback on what the ideal driver profile would be. Um, and so this is what the group kind of came up with. So we're looking for someone who's um, unselfish, agreeable, um, kind of even keel, you know, as a driver, some of the, the uh, char characteristics you look at and say patient, methodical, calm, um, think about those traits as somebody's driving through um, Chicago, I-94, at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, that certainly helps both in their job satisfaction, in their safe operation of a truck, um, to be methodical, calm, 
relaxed, patient, because I, I know driving my car through Chicago at that time, um, and unfortunately, relaxed, patient, and calm, I'm not always that way. It tends to be a very high stress level for me, which um, isn't the most healthy thing for both myself and maybe even for other drivers. Um, the second trend that we kind of see companies moving toward is um, really making an effort to speak the language of the next generation. So, I mean, in a lot of ways, Google is becoming our new business card. It's the new reference check. So if somebody's thinking about coming to work for your company, thinking about doing business with you, they're going to Google you and see what's out there. Um, if there are lots of positive things, that'll contribute to their image of you. Um, if there's some negative stuff, I mean, that's part of your identity too. If there's nothing out there about you, that says something as well. You, know, you think about Google. Google is, is one of those companies that has taken on, um, there, we, Google has become like Xerox and Kleenex. When you need a tissue to blow your nose, you say, I need to go get a Kleenex. It used to be when you needed to make a copy, it was, I needed to go Xerox this. Google has really become that type of company. Um, and Twitter, Google, Facebook, you know, I know a lot of people that are resistant to this type of technology to say that I don't do it, I don't want to do it, I don't want any part of it. Well, if you're in the, in the business of managing people um, across different generations, while you may not need to be an active participant in posting where you went to dinner on Facebook and taking a picture of your meal, you know, I think it would be probably a good thing to be familiar with it, to know kind of how it works, and maybe even um, keep tabs on it because that what your driver on Facebook may have just posted, which is a birthday celebration of his grandson, how cool would it be is if your dispatcher said, hey, you know, uh, Leroy, I saw that you posted a picture of your, your grandson's birthday. How, how, what a neat thing. And I mean, just it's little things like that that can drive that satisfaction level for the driver. Um, and here's kind of a cool example from one of our customers, Nussbaum Transportation. Um, I mean, their Facebook has a ton of interaction from current drivers, prospective drivers, and here's just a sample of a little interaction that we saw. Um, so a driver posted, I'd like to thank everybody for making me feel so welcome during orientation this week. Look forward to a long career at Nussbaum. Thanks again. Um, Nussbaum jumped in and responded right away. Um, but also what's kind of interesting is another driver kind of jumped in and said, you made a great choice coming over to Nussbaum. I think I speak for everyone when I say this is a company that cares about its drivers. We all know how it works with trucking and it as it's ups and downs, but they do what they can to get us home and keep us happy with our jobs. Um, one of the coolest things about social media, I think, is that there's an opportunity to empower your people to build your brand for you. So, I mean, if Newsbomb had taken Matthew's comment and tried to put it out as a marketing message, so this is a company that cares about its drivers. Um, it, ju it just doesn't have the same feeling that it does when it's coming from somebody a little more authentically. And when you get the younger generation, um, namely like Andrea's generation, Andrea, what do you look at when you're looking online to go to a restaurant or to buy a product? Are you looking and reading the company speak as far as the features, or are you looking at the individual consumer reviews and the number of stars that, that the individual consumers that. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't go to a new establishment without looking at the reviews or buy a, a product. I mean, I always read the Amazon reviews, read the reviews on Yelp, look at all those pictures of people's dinners that they're posting, because um, it, it means a lot more than what the marketing department says. And I can right. say that as somebody that works in marketing. <laughs> Absolutely, and it's authentic. I mean. um, on the flip side, um, if there's negative stuff out there, um, you want to control that too. Um, not trying to pick on any of the companies on the screen here because there's, I mean, there's plenty of stuff out there that you could find on almost any organization. Um, but like the truckersreport.com, people are posting um, comments, positive and negative, all the time about the companies that they work for and how their interview experience went. Um, basically, any detail you'd want to know about any trucking company that's out there. So if you haven't, I would encourage you to visit the truckersreport.com and search your own company name and see what comes up. I think on this is that 
you know, a lot of companies, this holds back companies from participating in social media because they're worried about these types of comments. Um, and, and they're out there. But if you look at some of the um, TripAdvisor, Yelp type sites, you know, they, those comments, when they get a bad review, they get addressed by the, the, the company management and address that um, particular complaint or whatever it is. Um, and quite frankly, it minimizes that complaint. Now, if it's a consistent complaint, and you can see a pattern, obviously, that's different. But you know, unfortunately, not everybody everywhere is going to have a wonderful experience in everything. And today's uh, media allows you to share that with everybody right away. So either we can choose to manage it and be a part of it, or we can let it manage us. Yeah, and I mean, to Chris's point, this is one of the things that scares people of getting involved in social media. But it's, I mean, it's out of your control to a certain extent because there are third-party platforms where people are posting this stuff, and you have no, you have no way of controlling what's out there. Um, the only thing you can do is try to influence the conversation in a positive way, um, so that, I mean, in a few of these examples, you look at um, drivers kind of complaining about the company that they work for. And in the really good ones, the good drivers will jump in and comment and come to the company's defense. Um, so I think kind of trying to facilitate that kind of interaction is the direction that we need to go. Um, a lot of the companies that we work with are saying that hiring drivers is the number one priority right now, more important than even attracting customers. Um, so if this is kind of your situation, I encourage you to take a step back and do a little bit of a self-audit. Um, if drivers are your number one audience, does your website, application, social footprint, what's in Google about you, does it reflect that? You know, I think we're seeing a lot of companies in, in the past, their website was their yellow page ad to outside customers. I need to be on the web so that my customer can find me. And, and, and while that is continues to be true, I would also argue that in today's driver environment, that it is as important, if not more important, to be driver friendly and driver facing on your website to look at them almost as one of your most important clients as far as attraction and retention. Because today, like Andrea said, and with the web out there and, and different generations, if you're interested in going to work for a particular company, one of the first things you're going to do is you're going to Google that company. You're going to see their website. And does it is it driver friendly? What what does it say? What does your brand say you are? Yeah, we're seeing a lot of companies, I mean, you can have the most beautiful website in the world, but if it's talking to your prospects and not to your drivers, I mean, that says something about where you place the importance. Um, another thing we're seeing, um, you know, either really long applications or PDF applications that are on people's websites. Um, I mean, what do you think a, a driver from my generation is going to do with this? Are they going to go to a desktop computer, print it off, hand write the responses to this application, fax or scan it back in to themselves, and then email it to the company? They're probably going to flip through the driver recruiting booklet at the next truck stop and move on to the next company. Um, because they have no shortage of places to invest their time. And if you think about what today's um, environment is across all generations, you know, it's all about that Twitter thing. It's, it's, it's uh, fast. We, we, we don't tend to have a lot of patience for stuff online to fill out a four-page app online. So we're seeing some companies just get bare bones information off their website and then be able to engage either verbally email, chat um, with the drivers to get them more information and to really get them on the line to fill out that application when they're ready. Oops. Technical difficulties here. All right, so um, trend number three. Uh, we think we're going to start seeing more and more companies tapping into new pools of candidates. Um, as you look up at the industry today, it's definitely dominated by Caucasian males. Um, about 4% of truckers are female. Um, 
the, the Hispanic number is starting to climb up a little bit. It was 9.7 at the time that this study was done back in 2005, um, and 11.7% African American. So, I mean, as we're looking to grow the number of drivers coming into the industry, we're going to have to start taking a look at these groups and how, how can we better appeal to these demographics. Well, you, and you think about, like, veterans. I mean, I think we're all um, – a safe statement would be that everybody – uh, is for veterans and um, what a great thing that if we could find a way to target uh, veterans to get them into the workforce I mean good work uh, typically hard workers responsible disciplined so the hero hired is another place where we may be looking for um, new drivers that isn't a typical location you know, in the, in, the, in the past, you could run your ads in the local newspapers, and you'd get calls. And, and if, you never, if you look at the Sunday paper, the help wanted section, which used to be about two sections of eight to ten pages each, is now probably one section of at most four pages. So it's just figuring out who you're going to target and then finding the best places and the best ways to target those particular people. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I always do is we're kind of looking at ways to help companies stand out from a recruiting perspective. Every gas station or truck stop I ever go to, I pick up every single one of those little recruiting booklets that are out there. Um, and you're really not seeing a lot of companies making an effort to speak to these groups. Um, you don't see a whole lot of pictures of diversity in the photos or people that are speaking directly to veterans. So there definitely is an opportunity there. So on this, and just, this is just an example, but Harley-Davidson, in an effort to really open up a new demographic in their market, I mean, they've begun targeting females. And you can see from this ad, I mean, they are, they are really appealing to that female demographic, which can probably tend to be a little intimidated by hopping on a big Harley, and they, they, it might be hard in their mind to get their mind around handling a machine that big on the open road. And in all reality, it's, it's very realistic and very doable, but we need to break down that barrier to, to, to that group of people to make it a possibility that they would even consider buying a Harley. Yeah, so Harley's done a really good job of recognizing that its <coughs> demographics need to change too for that company to stay competitive and relevant. So they're Keep an eye out for it because they're starting to show more and more women in their ads. Um, and to Chris's point, trying to identify, okay, what are the barriers that prevent a woman from being interested in the Harley and how do we how do we break those down and make it appeal to them? So think about this from your driver standpoint. I mean, are you doing this with your drivers? I mean, are we, are we making it um, uh, a possibility with females, Hispanics, Blacks, um, that they can see themselves driving for you. Have we really opened that door? Or is it just, you know, we're going to run a generic, uh, what I kind of refer to as a white dot ad in a driver recruiting magazine that sounds like everybody else. So maybe uh, a new file to open today in your mind would be maybe we can target those people and, and really come up with ways that they can see themselves driving for your company. And honestly, the market for that is wide open because not a whole lot of companies are really taking advantage of that opportunity just yet. Um, the fourth trend that we see kind of taking shape in the trucking company of the future is using data to drive performance and motivate drivers. Um, we have more data than we know what to do with. Uh, most of the companies that we work with aren't suffering from lack of data. It's more information overload. I mean, we can get really detailed analytics on, you know, if any of your trucks are speeding, fuel efficiency, um, hard braking, all kinds of data points that are available through um, the electronic devices that you may already have installed in your truck. Um, the challenge that we're seeing most companies face is taking that analytics and turning it into something actionable. So, okay, what does all this data mean and how do we communicate this in a way to drivers and driver managers? to hold them accountable for the results and show them how they can, can move the numbers in a positive direction. Um, so just a few examples of how you can help companies, help your team visualize this information. Um, 
we're working on a lot of little projects right now around driver scorecarding, but not just kind of your, your typical throw up and show up data representation, but really making it visual um, and related to the numbers that really tie back to performance for your company. So boiling it down to just a simple score and safety operations and fuel efficiency, ranking the drivers within the fleet so they can kind of feel a little bit of sense of competition and know where they stand, um, and then tracking trends over time. So think about it from, from your own standpoint. When your manager uh, approaches you with a review, do you appreciate more of a subjective review or an objective? You know, say if I would say to Andrea, boy, Andrea, I think you're really doing a good job. You, I think your work is good. And, and Or does it feel different to say, Andrea, you know, we've increased our, our marketing leads by 300% when you've been, I mean, it's just specific information and feedback on a person's job that I think we all crave and want. And to be able to um, work on our, our career and improve in areas that we might not be so good at, but also be recognized for areas that we are really good at. So think about how powerful this could be, is if you had a driver that in their scorecard, they happen to be your best driver for, um, I'm just going to use fuel. And if you came to that driver and said, you know what, Charlie, we really appreciate you, and we would love it if you could work with these two drivers to share with them your secrets to being able to score really high on fuel. And I think that that, that driver, Charlie, would take immense amounts of pride in being asked to share his secrets to success. Um, and so, I mean, there's a number of different ways you can visualize that data. Here's another example of how, how a driver-facing view of that could look. Um, and to Chris's point, one of the things that we find is really valuable about sharing this information is it puts the driver manager and the driver on the same side of the table. So it's not the, the manager trying to beat them over the head about something. It's, okay, here's what the data says. How can we work together to help this number move in a positive direction? Um, trend number five. Uh, we think the trucking companies of the future are going to succeed at um, showing all the awesome things that are going on in the industry. Um, I mean, trucking has suffered a little bit with um, maybe some stigma of like uh, trucks like this being on the road and being intimidating to the motoring public. Um, but there's a lot of positive things that are going on um, that I think we have the opportunity to tell the story of. Yeah, you know, you look back at that, that truck with the teeth in the front and, you know, you, you, you go to a focus group and say, what would that, what does that say to you? And they're saying, you know, well, that's scary, it's dangerous, it's, you know, a threat. And, you know, that's not the image that our industry really wants to portray. ATA, American Trucking Association, is working on a, a PR campaign to change that public perception of trucking, but it's not going to happen overnight. So I guess the way to, to, that you can really begin doing something today on it is there, think about to yourself, is there anything your company does that has the cool factor, and how can you showcase it? Whether that be, you know, your trucks have a really cool um, color scheme, paint, um, you know, you're, you've got maybe a, um, a I, I don't even know, but I mean, the cool factor, if you can figure it out and showcase it. Yeah, and kind of showing, too, the, the human side of trucking and what your drivers are doing so that, I mean, this isn't the image that people have of truckers. It's, you know, the guy that stopped to help you by the side of the road or the guy that rescued a, a little dog that was freezing at a truck stop. Um, I saw one of those come through actually on our, my Facebook today from one of our customers. But putting a, putting a human element on what we do and um, just showing a lot of the positive things that are going on. Um, one thing that H&I does to kind of try to, to elevate this a little bit is during Truck Driver Appreciation Week. I mean, that's a good of, as good of an excuse as any to kind of make sure that we're saying thank you to our drivers in a very public way and showing appreciation. Um, so we. We, we do this every year. We offer it free of charge, but we create these nine-foot banners that, that say thank you to drivers and that you can customize with your company's logo. Um, so we'll, we'll make sure to send all you information about that when we 
um, get to September again this year. But And you'd be surprised at the feedback we get from companies that do get these banners and they put them up and they post them. What a positive feedback they get from their drivers. Just almost the banner saying thank you. We appreciate your job and what you do. And and we all in our lives love to hear thank you. And drivers are no exception. And this is just maybe our little way to um, help you as a company say thank you to your drivers. Um, the, la the last trend we wanted to touch on, um, I mean, we got to start training the next generation of drivers and leaders now um, as early as possible. Probably not as early as in this picture, um, but groups like Elite where we can um, start developing the next level of talent uh, I think are going to be critical to success in the future. Yeah, you know, I mean, think about uh, a, a truck driver and think about them in the context of an airline pilot. Do they really do that different of a job? I mean, really, they're they're both driving uh, vehicles, um, but think about the perception that maybe an airline pilot has versus a truck driver. Now, maybe some of the stuff that the trucking industry has brought on itself um, versus the airline industry, I, I don't know. But I think what we have to do today is start training the next generation of drivers and leaders right away and get them into the stream of the industry and and allow them to experience what trucking is because quite frankly it's a great industry and elite like Andrea said the elite group the emerging leaders in transportation through Wisconsin Motor Carriers is really an effort to begin identifying that that talent and begin developing it to be um, leaders of the future um, so the last thing we'll kind of leave you guys with here is a, qu a quote from Seth Godin, who's kind of a business and marketing uh, advisor that we really respect. Um, but change almost never fails because it's too early. It almost fa always fails because it's too late. Um, this is obviously complicated stuff to deal with, but it's time to start taking steps in the right direction um, before we fall behind. You know, and I think that change you know some people are afraid of change some uh, some people embrace change but i think the end result of positive change for companies are you end up making more money growing your business and having more fun and i think we can all be for that so with that you know i want to give another plug out to the um, elite group if you are interested in participating in that elite group go to witruck.org um, there's information on the group there, and there's also an application you can fill out to join that group. <clears throat> we, we definitely are looking to grow it and to, to identify and develop those emerging leaders in transportation that can be there for the next generation. All right, so we will open it up to questions. Um, again, you can just go ahead and type those in the chat window of GoToMeeting. Um, Chris, here's, here's a question that would probably be good for you. Um, so is it, there's, there's differences between the people that are currently in the workforce and the ones that are coming in. So is it the responsibility of our organizations to change to accommodate them? Or in some cases, do the newer generations kind of need to catch up with how things really work in the workplace? The answer is, and I'm going to kind of cop out answer, is both. I think that you cannot force a square peg into a round hole by forcing people that are, you know, the Gen X or Gen Ys into something that they really don't want. I mean, that's just not in their DNA. Um, but at the same time, I think that we need to be upfront and honest with that particular person to say, you know what, this is who we are, this is what we do, and this is what we expect. Um, now, we can't be completely rigid on that, but I think it's fair to have those expectations. So um, I guess my answer to that particular question would be, um, I think we need to do both. Um, Chris, you talked a little bit about kind of bridging, bridging the gap between maybe the Gen Y manager and the, the boomer driver. 
I mean, what are some of the things that organizations can look at to, to kind of bridge that, that giant divide? Um, you know, I think that the training uh, in, is out there. Um, you know, if you, anybody wants some slides that we, we had today, they'll be available for download on our website. But, you know, really I, uh, a dr being able to identify maybe the characteristics of the different generations and sitting down in a room together and, and really agreeing that we are not the same and um, agreeing that it's okay to be different and asking the, uh, each one to make um, sacrifices and, and really understanding, <clears throat> excuse me, to be able to work together in a much more productive way. And I think that the, you know, going back to that culture index tool, and if we each have a culture index which identifies our, our um, personality traits and we sat down together and shared those with each other, I think it would go a long way towards understanding. Um, Chris, a, a couple of questions coming in about Elite. Um, who, who are you guys targeting as, in terms of membership for the group? Um, we are targeting people that are fairly new to the transportation industry, whether that be young or old. Um, people that are interested in getting involved and really becoming that next generation of leadership within the Wisconsin Motor Carriers Association to drive this into the future. Um, I was recently with the Wisconsin Motor Carriers out in Washington, D.C., um, a lobbying effort, uh, talking to Congress about trucking issues and why they matter. And, um, you know, the next generation really needs to be uh, aware of how that works within the industry and really be prepared to step in and pick up that torch from maybe some of the boomers um, and matures that are ready to retire and um, so we can keep our industry moving forward. Chris, on social media, um, what tools do you, or platforms do you see as most important for trucking companies to invest their time in? Um, I Personally, I think that Facebook is very powerful. Um, Facebook used to be the medium for my kids, and it was you know, all young kids on it, and it's really evolved today to be um, across multi-generation. And in fact, like I referenced earlier, a lot of the, the older generation is involved on Facebook, and it's a great way to push content to people um, and help manage in a very cost-effective way your brand. So, for example, if you, if you want your brand to be partly family friendly, family friendly, and we're pushing content through our Facebook page, showing our drivers at cookouts and things like that, that's fairly authentic. Yeah, showing not telling. Showing not telling. You know, whereas some of the other social media, you know, it, they're not bad. They're just maybe a little bit more challenging to do that in 180 character bits within Twitter. Yeah, we're, we're seeing a lot of um, the companies that we work with find a lot of success with Facebook ads in terms of recruiting drivers um, and also YouTube ads because those seem to be two places where drivers often go when they're, when they're trying to kill a little bit of time. Um, we're seeing some companies report better results with Facebook even than the things like Craigslist. Absolutely. Um, so we're right at 10.59 here, so I want to be respectful of everybody's time. Um, thank you, everyone, for dialing into the webinar, Chris. Thank you for sharing your insight today. I just want to say thank you to everybody. And again, one more plug for Elite. Um, we'd love to, to get some, to grow that group and, and really get those next generation of leaders identified and, and engaged and, and have a lot of fun along the way. So with that, I want to thank you again and have a great weekend. Thanks, everyone.